Another interesting option here is, again, if you find something like this and it's covered in craters and looks like a solar system planet like that, that means it's carrying meteorites, an entire sampling of meteorites from another star system. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, would have, you would have a lot of geologic sampling from that, that star system of origin just right there at your fingertips. You'd probably have to send somebody out there, you know, a manned mission. <laughs> which probably wouldn't be easy <laughs> but yes yes but still in the future if if such a thing were found i mean that's going to be the science of 200 years from now is exploring that thing right exactly no no that's exactly right and and you know it will also because of the distance of such a planet several you know if lsst is able to find it it would be at somewhere between 400 and 700 astronomical units current uh, propulsion technology you know co conventional propulsion technology would that would take quite a while to get there you know it, it would be doable it wouldn't be like going to the next star system which is of order 100,000 years but this would be maybe 80 years something like that however there are so many advancements in propulsion and you know even if you had a demo version of the breakthrough starshot system i mean to put this in context the the goal for breakthrough starshot is to get these you know tiny craft to be able to travel at 20 percent of the speed of light so we could reach the nearest star system in 20 years if you could get that working you know just in the solar system at that speed you could get out to to the distances we're talking about in two weeks i mean in two weeks you could <laughs> reach it i mean and the communication issues would be, I mean, the issue of, uh, of being able to communicate would be in a lot of ways resolved because it's, it's a lot closer. So there's a lot, not only is there a lot of exciting science that can be done when we hopefully find a planet like this, but I think there's, there are also a lot of exciting developments in space flight and propulsion that will allow us to study these kinds of things. And then the last thing I'll add is, you know, while it will be extremely hard and take a ton of effort, both from, from the perspective of observational astronomers, all the way to very gifted computer science who would optimize the blind shift and stack codes to reduce the magnitude penalty as much as possible. What would take all of that effort and LSST it would be at the very edge of the detection limit for LSST. If we know where the planet is, you know, if LSST finds it, something like JWST or Hubble can follow up and look at the planet and learn a lot of things about it from afar. The reason that JWST or Hubble can't find the planet is because they have very narrow fields of view, but the planet would be visible to them and, you know, we could get uh, photometry, and spectra and, and a lot of very interesting information as soon as we know where the planet is or where we think it might be. Hints in the outer solar system. There is a mystery, a, a strange feature of the far outer solar system known as the Kuiper Cliff. And it's been floated before that it may be a Mars sized object might be shepherding this in some way. Do you agree with that? Do you think that would be a, a good starting point to start searching? Well, where I sort of stand on it is that in hopefully a year or so, we'll start getting a, a fire hose of data about the outer solar system. And, and I don't think a lot of people appreciate just how torrential that fire hose is going to be. My understanding is that it'll at least 10x the number of objects known in the outer solar system. And so are our statistics will get way better. We'll be able to find, you know, if there is a Mars-sized planet at a closer distance, you know, that was perhaps scattered outward, if there is a Mars-sized distance at 100 or 200 AU, it would be, you know, quite bright as compared to the distances I'm talking about for a captured one. So you could hopefully find such a thing if it exists in the first few years of operation. But also the evidence for the Kuiper cliff and the evidence the, the, the evidence for the Kuiper cliff and the evidence for what lies beyond that and the evidence for orbital clustering will all improve dramatically 
that's sort of where I am on it. And I'll add to that also is, is that uh, what I'll add to that also is that discoveries in the outer solar system enabled by the Rubin Observatory could also point us in the direction of where this planet might be or these population, this population of planets where they might be. Because presumably you could also get captured Pluto-sized dwarf planets. And now while the while the mass function of free-floating planets has not been measured down to dwarf planets like Pluto, hopefully in the future it is, right? And if Pluto-sized dwarf planets vastly outnumber Mars-sized planets, then LSST much earlier on in, in the in in the survey, we should be able to find Pluto-sized dwarf planets that were captured in the birth cluster, and then those can be sort of the crumbs that lead us to the Mars-sized planets. And so I'm really excited. I think it'll be an amazing decade for the planetary science community. It's amazing to me because, you know, when I was first getting into amateur astronomy as a teenager, right around about 1988, 89, the uh, yeah, we thought of the outer solar system as just this big frozen wasteland full of comets that occasionally get perturbed and nothing else. You know, we weren't really envisioning you know these Kuiper Belt objects and things like that that we subsequently discovered. But now, after the New Horizons passed by a Pluto, the outer solar system is every bit as interesting and dynamic as the inner solar system is, and it's just done a complete change. Although there was one case. I think his name was Richard Muller. He he floated the idea that there was a red dwarf out there <laughs> that, oh, yeah. that kept sending hail, but that you know obviously didn't pan out. <laughs> but um, my question for you, my last question is this: one of the more out there wild possibilities is the idea of not a planet out there, but a primordial black hole. What do you think about that hypothesis? Yeah, so I mean, this is obviously a fun idea. I mean, I don't consider it as particularly likely, uh, but I, I did do some work on on the idea that there of what if a primordial black hole was out there in the outer solar system back in 2020 with Avi Loeb. And basically, the whole idea behind this was Batikin and Brown proposed that observed orbital clustering and the outer solar system implied some source, you know, something with mass in the outer solar system that could potentially be shepherding these trans Neptunian objects. Now, that could be a planet. Um, it could be a belt of, of, of planetesimals. All the evidence could be a statistical fluke, but let, let's for a moment say it ends up being real. It, it could basically be anything that has mass. And so one possibility is that it could be a black hole. I mean, it, it's a crazy idea because we don't know of any black holes with a mass less than that of a star, but it is a possibility. And it's a tantalizing one too, because, you know, even though the likelihood is, I would say, extremely low, the payoff is <laughs> extremely high. If there just happens to be a black hole orbiting the sun, uh, you could test all, all sorts of uh, physical theories and do crazy, crazy science. So there was this idea was, was, was floated in a paper. What if it was a primordial black hole? Ed Whitten wrote a paper saying, you know, if, if we don't, if telescopes don't find the planet that Batikin and Brown proposed that, you know, it might be a good idea to send tiny spacecraft to the outer solar system to see if they feel any disturbances and gravitational potential that that might imply the existence of a primordial black hole out there because such a black hole you know 5 to 10 earth mass black hole would be the size of a grapefruit so it'd be you know, i think the motivation there is you know it'd be extremely hard to find so maybe we should send a lot of crafts just to check and this you know this got a lot of press the the issue is that that would be extremely costly right that would probably be you know, a billion dollar space mission, something like that, if not more. And so, and so I was thinking about this proposal, you know, it was kind of 
a fun, very unlikely possibility, but fun. And I was just thinking, you know, is there any other way? I mean, that we could know whether or not there is a five to ten Earth mass black hole in the outer solar system, in the outer solar system, other than sending tons of tiny spacecraft out there. And what I realized, you know, I was <laughs> I was kind of th- this was kind of like a, a thought in the back of my mind for a good week or so during uh, you know in, in 2020, and then it hit me that. For such a small black hole, whenever it would, you know, accrete the odd comet or, you know, small piece of debris out there in the outer solar system, given the model of accretion for such a black hole, it would likely fall in the optical. So I ended up doing the calculations and I figured out that if there is a 5 to 10 Earth mass black hole in the outer solar system, LSST can actually find it. We need to we don't need to spend a single dollar extra because the data from LSST will tell us if there is a black hole hiding out there since it could it should undergo flares in the optical when it eats comets and other debris in the outer solar system. So I I, I thought this was a, a fun exercise. Uh, it, it saved uh a very extremely hypothetical billion dollars and it was a lot of fun but do i think it's a primordial black hole probably not but it would be cool definitely would be cool to have a picture of a primordial black hole 10 earth mass black hole accreting something anything (laughs) we could even play with it we'd go out there and and make it accrete stuff and oh yeah you you could throw things into it yeah and, and test all kinds of physics with it well no matter what Whatever we find in the outer solar system at this point on is going to be really interesting. And I'm looking forward to it. It's probably, as you said, the fire hose is going to turn on, which means I'm going to have a whole lot of interviews to do. Yes, you are, John. (laughs) Yes, you are. All right, Demir, I look forward to the next paper and we'll get together again. And good luck. Thanks for having me, John. Appreciate it.